Good morning, everyone. So I want to go ahead and get us started here. I'm Kelly Bourne. I'm the director of the Cyber Initiative at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And for those who haven't uh, joined us in a while, I was previously director of the Cyber Policy Center at Stanford. And so we are now uh, moving to co-host these webinars that previously we were hosting at Stanford. Uh, and we'll be doing these monthly uh, from here on out. So I'm really glad to be joined today for a conversation that I think is really timely on the topic of antitrust and to be joined by a great group of experts. We have Mark Limley with us here, who is a professor at Stanford Law. He is director of the Stanford Program in Law, Science and Technology, a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and also affiliated faculty in the Symbolic Systems Program. I think it's worth noting that Mark has actually published nine of the 100 most cited law review articles from the last 20 years, and so is incredibly um, well-respected for that and other things. Uh, we're also joined by Dina Srinivasan, who is a fellow at Yale researching tech competition and policy, and her research has really helped to provide some of the foundations for the current antitrust suits against Facebook and Google. And as I understand, I think Dina is currently working on the, the case against Google that was filed uh, here in the U.S. And then Sandeep Bahisan is the legal director at the Mo Open Markets Institute. And before that, he served as a regulations counsel at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and has published articles on a variety of topics in anti-monopoly law and policy. So really glad to have the three of you joining today. Um, first, just a bit of background uh, for those who may be less familiar. We have seen an enormous amount of activity on the antitrust front in the last few months, perhaps more than we have seen in the last 20 years or so. Uh, we saw starting uh, last October, the Department of Justice and 11 states filing a complaint against Google for alleged monopolization of mobile search and search advertising. Uh, then we saw in November, the European Union accusing Amazon of breaking EU competition rules. In December, two things happened. We saw the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and 46 states file parallel suits against Facebook in large part due to their acquisitions of WhatsApp and Instagram. And then again in December, two multi-state coalitions, one led by Texas, the other in Colorado, filing their own antitrust suits against Google. And then of course in January, a class action antitrust suit here in the US against Amazon. So a lot has been happening on this front. I think advocates of antitrust uh, suits and critics of the tech platforms have been looking for these suits to address all kinds of harms, everything from concerns about privacy to online disinformation and propaganda to concerns about price and competition. And of course, we've seen real concerns about whether these lawsuits are likely to hold water, given that the U.S. antitrust um, has typically, law has typically been grounded in price harms uh, rather than uh, broader uh, conceptualizations of harms that we've seen in Europe and other countries. So there's a lot to discuss here. Um, wanted to start off this panel with a conversation about what we know about the current suits against Facebook and Google. Um, and, and Dina, I would ask you to start us off there, but would love to have Sandeep and Mark chime in on that as they would like. Um, and then from there, would love to move to a second question and have Sandeep really walk us through how today's tech companies have gotten to achieve the market dominance that they have and concerns about whether and how the sort of history of acquisitions and exclusionary practices might have contributed uh, to this growth. Uh, and then Mark would love to turn to you uh, if you could walk us through if you what you think about the likelihood that antitrust suits here could be successful and that if they were, that they would actually create the kind of competition that we're interested in um, and, and versus some of the other remedies that we've heard discussed, things like improving interoperability or restricting startup uh, acquisitions or adjusting data rules and things like that. So, um, and then after that, we'll, we'll save about 20 or 30 minutes for Q&A. And so people can go ahead and insert questions as we go in the chat box. Uh, and there's an upvoting function. And then I'll do my best to sort of moderate those uh, when, we get, when we get close to the half hour mark. But uh, Dina, why don't we start with you and just this question of where are we with these current suits? What do we know about the theories of harm given that a lot of these platforms are free? So the price harm uh, is a harder argument to make. Uh, and I know there have also been a lot of uh, comparisons between digital ad markets and stock exchanges and, and that may be relevant here. So would love um, an update on where we're at. 
Thank you, Kelly. It's my pleasure to, to participate in this conversation today. So thank you for having me. Um, I think I'll start just for the benefit of folks on the call, um, just, just quickly on, on how antitrust law in, in the US works and, and really globally for the most part as well. So there's really two types of antitrust violations under US law. The first fits into the monopoly bucket. And the second really fits into the second section one bucket that has more to do with coordination between competitors. The example here that might be most recognizable is price fixing. If you have two competitors in the market that agree to a certain price, that of course violates antitrust laws and, and it does so because it violates section one as an illegal agreement between competitors. In the first bucket, however, we have this illegal monopolization and illegal monopolization cases really rest on three different prongs. The first is that the company has to be a monopoly. So this is often argued in terms of percent share of the market. If you own 90% of the market, then you're a monopolist. Um, but it can alternatively be proven um, through direct evidence that the company is you know, charging monopolistic prices or degrading quality and doesn't really have competitive constraints. So the first prong is again, to argue that a company is a monopolist. The second is, well, even if the company is a monopolist, like, you know, why do we care unless they're harming consumers in some way or their customers in some way? And in this respect, we look at what Kelly was mentioning, which is price. So do we see monopolistic prices being charged in the market? Um, and I'll stop here and just sort of answer this price question. Look, when we, when we watch pharmaceuticals increase the price of drugs, right? There's two ways that a pharmaceutical can do that. You can increase the price of a pill from $13 to $700, keep the quality constant, the milligram per pill constant, and you're measuring the, the difference in the price hike, right? But you can extract the same harm on consumers by keeping the price constant at $3 in degrading quality. So whereas historically from an antitrust enforcement perspective, we've had a lot of cases that have looked at price, quality has been baked into that sort of, you know, very bare mathematical equation um, forever. You know, it has, to, it has to have that quality variable in the equation in the first place to measure price hikes. The third prong of monopolization cases is even if a company is a monopolist and it's harmed comp, you know, consumers or its competitors when it comes to price or quality, what we care about now is, well, you still really haven't violated antitrust laws in the US unless you've done, you've gotten to be a monopolist by engaging in some illegal conduct. And what we mean here is it's sort of a broad category. We call it anything that falls under, you know, are you competing on the merits or are you doing, you know, something different? Are you cheating? Are you deceiving? Are you blocking customers from coming in? Are you erecting barriers to entry? Are you building moats? That kind of thing. So with that understanding, I'll now touch briefly um, on, on the case against Facebook and then, and then some of the cases against Google. So, you know, with respect to Facebook, it's really interesting. We have a number of class action cases, but in terms of government enforcement, we have, um, we have the case um, both by the FTC and the 48 attorneys general against Facebook for monopolization of the social network market. So, you know, the, the customers here are the consumers. And what's really interesting about this case, and so I'll just talk about the second prong. What's really interesting about this case is that this is a free market, right? So when we're talking about harm, um, we're really stretching our thinking kind of because the price is constant at zero and we're looking, okay, therefore, what is the quality variable that's decreasing? And the, the research that I did in this area is that um, what well, you can see it if you focus on one very you know, specific variable of privacy and specifically I looked at, you know, is Facebook able to extract from its users the ability to track them off of Facebook? Because we have a lot of history here of the firm entering the market, competing on privacy, promising not to do that, trying to do that over time, but it couldn't because there was competition in the market and then competition exited and voila. So that's sort of um, the really interesting thing I think that most, most people find fascinating about the Facebook case. When it comes to Google, we have a number of cases filed against Google. We have a Google monopolization case in the search market. Um, we have uh, the case that was filed by the Department of Justice. 
we had the case filed by attorneys general against Google and the search market in terms of how they're pushing competitors sort of um, on the search page itself out by preferencing its own mapping service or its own travel service, that kind of thing. And then we have the case against Google and advertising markets. And um, uh, let's see here. So, so at a very high level, and Kelly, am I almost out of my time? Are we okay? Okay. You're doing, you're doing fine. All right. So, so in, so what's really fascinating is like online ads, we're really talking about online ads because Google makes about 86% of its revenue from selling ads. And um, all online ads today, for the most part, trade in real time on centralized electronic trading venues. And this really happened, this metamorphosis in the market happened the same time that even the New York Stock Exchange migrated to centralized electronic trading on servers. And so we have these sort of electronic exchanges in the stock market, we have these electronic exchanges in the advertising market. But the other thing that's really fascinating about the advertising market and about Google is unlike in cryptocurrency markets, um, which are also trading now in centralized exchanges, the structure of the ad market also looks really similar to financial markets. So on the buy side and the sell side, buyers and sellers also have to go through intermediaries, brokers to basically buy and sell on these exchanges. And when you look at sort of how and why is Google distorting trading in the advertising market, you can literally map every little conduct exactly onto some kind of conduct that we prohibit or make illegal with regards to trading on stock exchanges, right? So we have rules like your brokers have to manage their conflicts of interest. They can't, you know, serve you as a customer, but then trade ahead of your order. That's called insider trading. So we have rules around data and privacy and conflicts of interest and order routing and liquidity. And those rules were adopted for the express purpose of making competition in these exchange markets work. And then the other thing, if you zoom out, is like 161 countries across the world have joined hands through an international organization and are implementing these same rules in these different markets. And now they're looking at sort of the evolution of other markets like cryptocurrency markets. And they're like, golly, we better apply these rules there too. And so the case against Google and advertising markets, while it's an antitrust case, is very much about that type of conduct. Dina, thanks so much. Really helpful. And Sandeep, Mark, anything you would add to the, the sort of current state of these suits before we turn to Sandeep to talk about kind of how we got here? Yeah, I mean, so just to know in um, procedural terms, right, only suits are recently filed. We don't have any even kind of early substantive response from the courts, so we don't know exactly where they're going. The overarching thing I might add is um, I think for different reasons in both Facebook and Google, there's a little bit of a disconnect between what it is that people seem troubled by uh, when it comes to the tech platforms and what it is that antitrust can do for you uh, and what these lawsuits are, are aiming at, right? So, um, uh, you know, so Dina uh, I mentioned with Facebook, right? The big concern is privacy. Are they degrading your privacy, selling your data, tracking your data? across multiple platforms and the like. Um, uh, but it's not obvious how one fits the antitrust uh, theories uh, that the governments have filed right neatly into that box, right? And so uh, what the government has focused on are a couple of things. Uh, one are the acquisitions um, uh, several years ago of Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, uh, and I think it's probably fair to say those acquisitions were should not have been allowed in the first place, right? And uh, and enabled concentration, or at least took away potential competitors from that market. Um, uh, but it's not clear if you demonstrate that that was a problem and that we can fix it now, right? How to connect that to the uh, to the sort of privacy. Uh, concerns that people have asserted uh, uh, with respect to Facebook. I think the, uh, the situation is even more interesting with respect to Google, right? Because the various lawsuits have, uh, have different legal theories, um, but it's not clear that the 
lawsuits, even if they get what they want, are going to give people sort of what they expect or what they seem to be uh, hoping for from an antitrust case against Google, right? If, if what you want is effective competition in the search engine market and you feel like you don't have it right now, um, well, you could in fact say, hey, um, Apple shouldn't be allowed to charge uh, for default placement of which search engine it will use. Uh, right, that's one of the big allegations in the um, uh, in the U.S. government's complaint. Uh, Google paid uh, billions of dollars to be the default search result on Apple, um, but somebody's going to be the default search result on Apple, uh, you know. And maybe it'll be uh, Google because they're better, or because they are the one everyone uses right now. Uh, maybe we'll rotate it, or we'll make everyone use Bing unless they come change their mind. Uh, and, and, and switch the default, but it's not obvious that that's going to sort of help uh, uh, get us better search engines uh, in, the, in the long run. Advertising markets are really interesting, uh, and we can have a longer conversation about this. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think sort of Dina's right to say this is an antitrust case, but it is echoing what we've done in other markets, not via antitrust, but via regulation. Right. The reason we have a bunch of rules about conflict of interests in the securities markets, uh, about disclosure of information and the like, is not because antitrust law says we need that for competition. It's because we wrote specific regulatory rules for a sector that we viewed as needing specific regulation. Uh, it's not obvious to me that antitrust sort of is going to get you there or that if it does, it will... Uh, uh, get people what I think they want out of a lot of this, which is maybe more control over their own information uh, and more privacy. Mark, thanks. Um, Sandeep, any responses to this or would also love to turn to you just to talk about this question of really how we got here. And I think, uh, you know, you've seen these articles alleging that, it, for example, in the case of Amazon, that basically someone sort of sat down, looked at a map of all of the antitrust laws in the U.S. and then figured out their ways you know, just quite exactly around those. Um, would love to hear more from you about how we got here, the sort of history of acquisitions and exclusionary pricing that may have contributed to this. Sure, uh, I'll just offer a quick response to what Dina and Mark said. So I think for the enforcers uh, bringing, who have brought the cases against Facebook and Google, they have one thing in their favor. Compared to other areas of antitrust law today, Monopolization law is still somewhat less price centric. So Dina mentioned the relevant legal standard. This goes back to a 1966 case called United States versus Grinnell. The court said the offensive monopoly under section two, the Sherman Act has two elements, the possession of monopoly power in the relevant market and two, the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of a superior product business acumen or historic accident. So there's an implicit norm of fair competition. A monopolist that simply captures the whole market by making a better widget is not liable. But a monopolist that uses practices like refusals to deal, exclusive dealing, below cost pricing, deception, industrial sabotage could be liable under the antitrust laws. There's, an, there's a norm of fairness here. And section two of the Sherman Act says monopolists can use certain competitive tactics, but not others. And so this fairness norm, I would argue, still trumps the focus on prices and other consumerist measures. So in the DC Circuit's opinion in United States versus Microsoft, which is certainly one of the biggest uh, monopolization cases of the past 25 years, the, the court said, suffice it to say that it would be inimical to the purpose of the Sherman Act to allow monopolists free reign to squash nascent, albeit unproven competitors at will, particularly in industries marked by rapid technological advance and frequent paradigm shifts. And that language, I think, is very helpful to the federal government and the states in these suits because it shows that really preserving fair competition, restricting certain competitive practices by monopolists is still the thrust of Section 2 law, even in this era of uh, quote unquote consumer welfare. Um, but I guess with that, I can, I should just talk about how we got here. How did these companies get so dominant? Um, I won't rehash what Dina said, but I, I will sort of maybe speak at a somewhat higher level of abstraction. So until very recently, the 
these companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple, had cultivated this story that they had succeeded solely through superior products and innovation. So in the words of Grinnell, to the extent that they had a monopoly, it was because of a superior product, business acumen, or, ac or historic accident. So they hadn't engaged in any of the bad conduct sufficient to trigger monopolization liability. Uh, but these suits actually show a very different and much less flattering story for at least Facebook and Google. Uh, the suits allege that these companies have actually grown in significant measure through a spree of acquisitions. Um, according to the House subcommittee report from last fall, both companies have purchased dozens of firms, I believe 200 in the case of Google, and they've also engaged in practices that run afoul of existing antitrust doctrine on things like exclusive dealing, tying, and refusals to deal. So in the case of Google, it's been accused of bundling various apps to extend its dom dominance into mobile search. It used exclusionary contracts with handset makers and wireless carriers. So for instance, it pays Google an estimated $12 billion a year to be the exclusive search tool on on Apple devices. So in, a, in effect, Google is sharing a portion of its monopoly profits with Apple as a way of insulating its product from rivals such as Bing and Yahoo. And as the Texas suit has alleged, uh, Google's also used various uh, practices to maintain its, uh, maintain its dominance in ad tech. And this is the technology that connects advertisers with publishers across the internet, not just on Google properties. So in the case of Facebook, it grew notably through acquisitions of WhatsApp and Instagram, uh, mergers that the FTC cleared without any remedy, and then engaged in assorted practices like tying and refusal to deal as a way of squelching nascent competitors to its dominance in social networking. And we've really learned in recent times that the antitrust enforcers in the Obama administration could have gone after these companies, especially Google. So Leah Nyland had a great story in last week's Politico where the FTC had already identified the practices that are now the subject of litigation. And the legal staff had recommended the commissioners file a lawsuit. Uh, unfortunately, the economists uh, presented a different story and said that there's, there's really nothing to see here and relied on some really questionable and flat out false assumptions in making their recommendation. So for instance, in 2012, the FTC's economists told Chairman John Leibowitz that they felt that mobile search would never be a particularly big market and most people would continue to use search on their desktop, which, which, which was flatly false even in 2012. And, you know, people had started the migration over to iPhones, tablets, Android devices. So this, is, this was a, a, an assumption and prediction that was false in real time. You didn't really need to project ahead five or 10 years to show that the FTC's uh, economist predictions were wrong. But better late than never. Um, I certainly think the suits should have been brought five or 10 years ago to have prevented these two companies from cementing their dominance, extending their dominance into so many markets. But I'm glad that the agencies are acting. Um, of course, they have a, a long road to hoe ahead of them. None of these suits are gonna be resolved anytime soon. But at a minimum, these suits show these companies that they are bound by the rule of law. They cannot simply escape the restrictions of antitrust law through sustained and ongoing lobbying. And I'll just quickly wrap by talking a little bit about what Mark mentioned. So the antitrust suits are helpful in a number of ways in containing and hopefully rolling back the power of these companies, but they don't necessarily go after the core business model of these two firms. And that's advertising. Google and, at, and Facebook offer a value proposition to advertisers. We will direct your ads more precisely and more accurately than rivals like the New York Times, let alone TV, newspapers, or billboards. And part of the reason is they just have so many users who are on their properties and services all the time. So Facebook has 2.5 billion active users, then billion users each on Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp. Google has nine services with over a billion users. So they can track us and build detailed profiles in a way that other publishers can't. Um, so this really supercharges their surveillance advertising. And I think the antitrust lawsuits by potentially shrinking their footprint online and really offline can reduce their surveillance dragnets. But we also have to think about whether surveillance advertising is a fundamentally sound business model or is it in, or does it require sustained and improper violations of our privacy 
um, facilitations of violations of non-discrimination law. And I think of most salience of late, does this business model basically rely on disseminating and promoting incendiary content, um, whether it's white nationalist conspiracies in the United States or anti-Rohingya stories in Myanmar, which uh, helps spur a ge genocide. So I think that's something we have to think about. And I think it's related to the on ongoing antitrust lawsuits, but it's also, it's also distinct and will require new and I think creative approaches to antitrust consumer protection and privacy laws. I, so if I could jump in here, I, so I, this is great. I mean, I, I, I wanna pick up on the last point. There are a couple, couple points uh, to make. Um, I, you're right to say that it is related but distinct and might require some creative approaches. I might I might go a little further than that. I think there are some pretty fundamental contradictions in the sorts of things that people want out of um, uh, antitrust. Once once we get past the questions that Dina raised, right, uh, the traditional question of price or the question of sort of degradation of product quality. Um, and so one way to think about that is to ask the, um, uh, the question that, that Sandeep just ended with, right, which is, um, do we want an efficient market in uh, targeted advertising? Uh, and one possible answer to that is yes, I actually think targeted advertising is generally better than untargeted advertising because it's likely to give you products you're interested in. Um, uh, it may be that you could get sort of the same advertising uh, the bang for your buck, right, with fewer ads uh, that were uh, that were aimed at the right people. Um, uh, reasonable people can disagree with that, right? You could say, no, you know what? I don't like the idea. It's creepy that they know what I'm doing, where I'm going on vacation, uh, and um, uh, and I don't like the idea that uh, that these companies have information about me, and I want that to stop. Um, as a policy matter, I think that's a perfectly reasonable debate to have, right? As an antitrust matter, it's not at all obvious that antitrust is uh, sort of capable of uh, saying, "Yeah, all right, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, kill off surveillance advertising. We're gonna kill off targeted advertising." Right? And I think a lot of the litigation that's being brought, right, makes quite reasonable points. And Dina sort of adverted to some of these about how the advertising markets are being run. Uh, the Texas allegations that Google and Facebook are colluding uh, in the advertising markets, if true, are extremely troubling under traditional antitrust principles. Uh, the idea that, uh, that Google might be manipulating the exchange um, uh, auction exchanges, uh, while it's also a participant in that market, again, if true, is traditionally is troubling under traditional antitrust principles. But you could fix both of those problems, and what you would get at the end of the day is a more efficient mechanism for delivering targeted ads, uh, more targeted ads at a lower price to more consumers. Right? Uh, the 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 way antitrust would normally think of this market is. Google and Facebook are gumming up the works. They're making it harder for uh, companies to buy information about us, to use that information in targeted advertising and to deliver uh, low cost targeted advertising to us. If we can get rid of those uh, obstacles in the middle, uh, we will have a more efficient market. But I think that's a more efficient market that a lot of the people who are pointing to antitrust right, don't want to exist at all. Uh, and so making it more efficient may be great. I think it is great from an antitrust perspective, uh, but it may be uh, that there's a disconnect between uh, what it is that people actually want, which is I want there to be a different business model than the one that exists uh, and, um, uh, and what antitrust can give you, right? Which is a more efficient, less compromised version of, uh, of that business model. So Mark, before you, before you jump onto, um... Your piece, can I respond to that? Cool. So I would just say that um, I think that, you know, to really answer this question, we have to get a little bit particular about what we're talking about. And I'll just give two examples of how and why antitrust would remedy to some extent targeted advertising. So the first point is that when we're talking about targeted advertising, it's not like, you know, is advertising targeted or is it not targeted? It really is a continuum. And the, and the question is where on that continuum is the equilibrium um, that, you know, where is the competition equilibrium on that continuum? So for example, Facebook historically had no problem extracting from consumers consent to, to deliver 
targeted advertising based on information that Facebook knows um, from their Facebook activity. So you come to Facebook, I'm going to track you, and then I'm going to deliver targeted advertising based on that information. There was one thing that Facebook was trying to do, which it was not able to get consumers to consent to. When you go to the New York Times, can I Facebook make a record of what you write on the New York Times and sell you targeted advertising based on that? How about not just the New York Times? How about a million sites across the internet? That's where we get to something that looks more like surveillance. You know, that was the point in on the continuum that I would say competition did not permit. And so, you know, the the, the lowering of competition pushed that point on the continuum um, off the equilibrium and, and towards, you know, um, an, another point that just was only permitted because there's a lack of competition. And that switch really happened in 2014, the same month that face that Google exited the social network market um, to some extent. And then, and then when it comes to, for example, Google, so Google operates, has, a, has its fingers in a lot of different pies. So when it comes again to targeted advertising, one of the things that's happening is Google's able to act as a broker to buyers or sellers and gather data about their consumers from, from that function. And then it gathers data from its exchange. And then, you know, it's also gathering data, for example, from its own sites like YouTube. And the lack of competition is permitting Google, for example, to string all those data sets together, which is a flip that happened in 2016, and then increase the level of targeted advertising based on, you know, all those data sets. So from a consumer harm perspective, again, it pushes the point on the continuum off the equilibrium. And then from an ad trading market perspective, now it looks something akin to insider trading. You're acting as a broker, you're serving the buyers or sellers, and now you're merging the data sets on the back end to sell your own advertising like search and YouTube. And so from a competition perspective, it explains the consumer harm, but also explains distortion in ad trading. Sorry. Thank you, Diane. Very helpful. And so what I'd love to do now, unless there are other comments or Mark on this, I mean, I want to first ask you all, there's seat, and then I want to move to Q&A. So if people want to go ahead and enter questions there, I'd be happy um, to take those up. But um, two questions, one around your views on the impact that a successful, that one of these successful antitrust suits would have if they were successful, because I think there have been concerns that you know, or at least hopes that this would address disinformation or, uh, you know, a whole range of other harms that are not really directly related to the size of the companies, although maybe inadvertently through the amount of data that is collected that then to Sandeep's point allows for more targeted advertising. And um, so it, how much confidence do each of you have that of the, let's say, half dozen harms that have been articulated between competitive harms, price harms, uh, harms to the information ecosystem uh, or harms to privacy, which of these do you actually have confidence that a successful antitrust suit would help to remedy? Yeah. And or maybe this, other, I mean, I feel like people have looked to a whole lot, to antitrust to, to solve a whole lot of harms. There may be others I'm missing here. Right. And, and, and this to me is, is one of the things that I'm most concerned about. I, I think, that, I think, Antitrust enforcement in this industry is valuable. It can do useful things to us, but we we have we do have this sort of idea that we're it's going to solve all of our problems. I don't think it's going to solve all of our problems, and I think there are some it will probably make worse. All right, so let me start with sort of where Sandeep started, right, which is the sort of idea idea of how do we get this dominance. Um, I mean, I. I, I guess my view is a little bit different than his in that I would distinguish between how these companies got dominant and how they stay dominant. And I think most of the things that uh, the antitrust suits are targeting uh, are not actually aimed at how these companies ended up being in the position they're in. They're more at how did I stay there? How do I try to extend it and the like? Um, Google ended up a dominant search engine because it was better by far than anything that was around, uh, right? And people just started using it. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's true starting in sort of the sort of mid, right, uh, really the end of the 90s, right? But certainly by the early 2000s, um, uh, it just sort of wiped the floor with its competitors. Uh, and I think that's still true today. 
Right. Uh, I, you know, I, I want there to be search engine competition. And so I have affirmatively tried to sort of leave Google and go use other search engines and they're just not as good. Right. Now, there may be reasons why Google reinforces and holds on to that dominance and antitrust may be able to go after those reasons. Right. I think, for instance, uh, antitrust should be much more aggressive than it has been uh, at targeting acquisitions by uh, uh, dominant firms, particularly acquisitions of nascent competitors or startups who might grow to be a, a threat uh, in the market. Um, but I'm not sure at the end of the day that if even if we'd sort of enforced the antitrust laws, uh, the anti-merger laws fully, we wouldn't have ended up with a Facebook or a Google that were in a dominant position. And one reason for that is network effects, right? Uh, we've actually, uh, one reason may be superior quality, right? Google had a better uh, uh, quality product. I think that's sort of hard to dispute. Facebook is much more uh, kind of what's your personal taste, but people gravitated to it certainly um, uh, in a way that they didn't to, to Google Plus. Uh, and so while I wanted there to be competition in social media, right there, and to some extent there is, um, you know, some of it is, is what did consumers choose? And so this, I think, leads to the question of sort of what, you know, what will antitrust get us? Um, and I'm not sure that if what we want is an atomistic comp competitive market of the kind that we have, you know, or should have in the wheat industry, uh, right? Or, or maybe even sort of in, a, in an industry like steel that could have, uh, that has large plants. Um, I think network effects and human behavior make it hard to say that we're gonna, we're gonna have that, right? We don't actually want 10 competing incompatible social networks. Uh, society would not be best served by being able to talk to only a 10th of the people you're interested in. Um, the ways we get competition in network markets traditionally have been uh, either interoperability, right? Uh, yes, you can have a platform, but people have to be able to sort of get uh, data on and off of that platform to connect their platform to it, uh, to allow uh, uh, information to cross those boundaries or so-called Schumpeterian competition, the idea of creative destruction, which is, yeah, you're gonna be the dominant firm for a while, but then here comes this new thing uh, that's gonna knock you off and they'll be the dominant firm for a while, but there's always somebody coming up behind. And I think the real problems that antitrust can address, right, are uh, the fact that we've stalled that Schumpeterian competition, uh, that we're allowing the Googles and the Facebooks to buy up and shut down the nascent competitors. Uh, and that in some sense, that is the Silicon Valley business model, uh, right? Venture capital is, is directed, it used to be directed at IPOs and, and successful companies. Now it's directed at how can I uh, get my company positioned to sell out to the incumbent? Um, uh, that may make you a lot of money, but it's not uh, ultimately giving us what Silicon Valley promised to give us, right? Which is the next big thing that's going to disrupt the existing technology. Uh, so I think we can get some simulacrum of kind of market competition, uh, and that's a good thing. It's not going to give us everything that we want. I'm I'm dubious that it's going to give us the kinds of privacy that people want, right? I think we might actually see a more efficient advertising market um, that leads to less privacy and more sales of our data um, uh, if we're not careful. I'm quite confident that it won't give us uh, better content moderation information and control. Uh, and in fact, I suspect it will go in the opposite direction, right? A competitive social media market is going to be one in which uh, there are a bunch of people out there uh, uh, the parlors of the world offering, uh, yeah, you know what, uh, uh, all bets are off, feel free to, to uh, uh, engage in hate speech, feel free to engage in sort of uh, election disinformation, COVID disinformation and the like. If you want sort of content moderation, you might actually be happy with a uh, few very dominant firms that act in a more or less socially responsible manner uh, and efforts to try to nudge them to do that. Um, that's, you know, that might, again, again, might be a valuable goal. It might not be a valuable goal. I'm not sure it's a goal that antitrust law is going to get us. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I think a lot of people have brought up this network effects question of if you were to break up the platforms and you had a bunch of baby Facebooks, would one of them not just grow to become a dominant Facebook in the future anyways? And um, I think on the content front, 
it's an interesting question of whether or not it would help solve the problem. I think some people define the problem as you have a whole range of viewpoints on Facebook and that there are at least were historically a large number of moderates who might sort of risk uh, by having more extremists on the site, you might be actually starting to contaminate the moderate base with much more extreme ideas and sort of pulling them out to the edges. And so if you think that's the dominant problem, then having more parlors out there might actually be a better alternative to sort of silo those ideas, even if they do become more extreme. But I'm curious, Sandeep, do you know, what do you think about you know, what are the half dozen harm? I mean, the, of those that I've articulated, the harms that have been um, sort of attributed to the platforms, which of them do you think it is realistic to assume that antitrust might effectively and, and to the network effects point sustainably address? Yeah, so I think when we talk about antitrust, we often boil it down to the Sherman Act, which prohibits restraints of trade and monopolization. But we also have other statutes on the books at the federal level. And I think one extremely relevant and potentially very powerful statute in this area is the FTC Act. So on, it has two prongs. It prohibits unfair methods of competition, which is generally seen as the antitrust piece of the FTC's mission, and also prohibits unfair and deceptive acts or practices, which falls on the consumer protection side. And I think the FTC can actually do a lot here to restrict these particular business models using both UMC, the competition power, as well as UDAP, the consumer protection power. And you know, the, the courts have repeatedly held that you know, these are both fairly broad and elastic authorities that don't have the same constraints that the Sherman and Clayton Acts do. So I think the FTC could do a lot here to go after the, the basic business model itself. And, you know, I think the antitrust suits that have been filed so far are a, a necessary uh, first step, but more needs to be done. And I think we should look to things like rulemaking that uh, restrict uh, surveillance advertising and ultimately force these companies to figure out different business models, maybe some combination of contextual advertising, some reliance on subscription uh, fees for premium services, which is something they already do to a, to a limited extent. Um, and I think, you know, we should think hard about whether surveillance advertising is actually serving us as a society well. Um, on the one hand, you know, we see sustained invasions of our privacy. Google and Facebook know what we're doing virtually every hour of the day, every waking moment. Uh, these businesses also facilitate illegal discrimination. ProPublica has run a series of stories showing that Facebook allows uh, racist landlords or misogynistic bosses to target their ads for housing or for job openings only to whites or only to men. So that's something we also have to think about when we talk about targeting. Targeting is often just a benign way of describing discrimination, which in some cases is illegal under federal law and represents an important social norm. So there's that. Uh, I think third, you know, there is the issue of incendiary content. You know, the, the constant desire for eyeballs means promoting things like, you know, the Pope uh, endorsing Donald Trump in the 2016 election, sensationalist news over sober, uh, truthful news. And it's not so much a question of should certain stories be censored or suppressed. It's a question of do these business models actually encourage uh, companies to promote false stories over truthful stories. And I should wrap by saying Mark kept talking about the efficiency of surveillance advertising. And I think that's generally an article of faith in this industry and you know, advertisers certainly behave as though surveillance advertising is more effective than advertising or on TV or certainly in the newspaper. But there's actually growing evidence that this advertising is actually not more precise, it's not more accurate than traditional methods of advertising. There's a lot of misinformation on what ads are effective, what ads are reaching whom, and there's also rampant fraud. And so I'll just close by recommending a book by Tim Huang that goes into some of the real systemic problems in this business model. So we should emphasize that it's a perceived superiority of surveillance advertising instead of accepting that as an established fact. Can I, can I throw in one thing? I don't want to hear from Dina too, but um, uh, I, I mean, I, so I think a lot of those criticisms are well taken. Uh, maybe all of them are well taken, but note that they are criticisms of the basic business model of the company, right? And that's not something that antitrust law 
I think has sort of even even in a broad vision of antitrust law would, would view itself as as able to target. Right. To say, yeah, you know what? We just don't like the fact that you're doing business this way. Maybe we should regulate it. Right. Maybe there are illegal acts uh, like discrimination that are that are forbidden under separate statutes. Uh, but I don't think any trust law can get us. Uh, hey, go make your money another way. The closest we can get, I think, from antitrust law would be uh, to open the market to potential competitors who would allow for the test of the possibility that this is not the right business model, right? If in fact there's a there's a nascent competitor that says, you know what, I'm going to charge a subscription fee uh, instead of uh, doing targeted or contextual advertising because I think it leads to all of these problems. Either I think it's ineffective, right, or I think it's it's promoting extremist content because it turns out that's what people engage with more. Um, uh, that's great. And we ought to try to push that. Uh, but I think sort of a more direct intervention that just says we don't like your business model, it's wrong, is is pretty far outside the bounds of where antitrust has traditionally gone. Dina, other thoughts from you on this question about the harms that antitrust is likely to address? And then I have a few questions from the audience. I want to. Sure. Um, I would agree with Mark's last point, which is, you know, I'm in a very poor position to guess whether antitrust law is going to fix any of the enumerated problems. The bigger point with antitrust law is that it's, it's trying to restore competition, right? So the objective of the law is to fix problems with competition so that vigorous can competition can take hold. And then who knows, right? That's for the market to answer. And the market's going to answer these questions much better than I can predict, um, uh, much, much better than I can predict. And I think it's a much more powerful tool than even regulation. Uh, thanks, Dina. I have a number of questions here. I want to jump can to I actually one. quickly respond, Kelly. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Please. So, you know, I think one thing we have to bear in mind is every market is the product of rules. There's no such thing as a free market where anarchy prevails. The law, including antitrust, restricts certain business methods, certain business strategies, and channels business strategy in other directions because there's a, an assumption or recognition that, you know, deception is bad for, is, a, is an unfair form of competition. It cheats consumers, it cheats honest businesses. So the market is a construct of law. And we're really talking about, you know, what are the configuration of rules we want for digital markets? And so there's no, I, you know, I, I reject the idea that if we, if we, you know, break up these companies that, you know, utopia will emerge. I don't think so, but, you know, we can limit their power while in parallel also figuring out what are the types of strategies these com companies should be allowed to engage in. Should they have carte blanche to do surveillance advertising? Should we place some restrictions to safeguard privacy, protect against racial and gender discrimination? So we should be talking about, you know, what does the market look like rather than hoping for some free market utopia? And yeah, I would just say that I, I agree. I don't think that competition is the only answer. And when we're talking about discrimination with, with you know, algos, that's a problem that's gonna be cross economy. It's not even specific to these firms, but these are major policy questions that I think rest on top of a desire for the free market to also come in and help answer some of these questions. All right, so I want to now, thank you all for this. This has been really helpful. I want to jump in and try and do a lightning round of questions. We've got uh, quite a few here. I want to start with our colleague, Daphne Keller, who runs at Stanford, the program on platform regulation and was formerly a lawyer at Google. Daphne has a question around unbundling, basically approaches like the mandatory version of what Twitter has called its project Blue Sky, which basically introduced competition between providers of different content moderation groups um, Daphne, I actually don't know, Michelle, if you're able to promote Daphne or if she wants to be promoted to a speaker, but I presume that this is something like what Frank Fukuyama and others at Stanford had proposed, uh, a, a sort of middleware solution wherein you could actually require that tech companies, oh good, Daphne, you could just tell me if this is the middleware solution where tech companies uh, can basically, hi Daphne, it's good to see you. Hello. Uh, yes, I mean, it's what I've written about as magic APIs or, or Mike Masnick has written about as protocols, not platforms, but basically introducing competition in new providers of moderation and ranking, but that still builds on top of this um, 
shared infrastructure of the data and content held by the, the platforms themselves. Um, and there are a million hurdles to that from privacy law and from, uh, you know, <laughs> material support of terrorism laws. But I'm just curious about from an antitrust perspective, is that even something where antitrust is a relevant tool for arriving at something like that? Or is that something that only non-antitrust specialists even think about? Uh, yeah, so I- Really quickly, Mark, if I can, just for the audience to provide some color. I think Daphne, when you first wrote about it, uh, or it might've been Mike Massey, but I think it was you who said, you know, something like letting Disney or the New York Times provide a, their own filtering algorithms that would be an alternative that people could opt into. Sorry, Mark, go exactly. ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think I think antitrust does have a role to play here and it's, and it's a critical one. If I, I think uh, the, to me, the most interesting and prevent and potentially uh, game-changing part of any of the lawsuits we've talked about is a part we haven't actually discussed, which is, the lawsuit against Facebook and the challenge to the way in which they uh, manipulate APIs. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot of individual legal and technical and economic hurdles around sort of interoperability and, and creating this middleware layer. Um, uh, but antitrust can help cut through some of those, uh, not because it's a violation not to do it, but as a remedy for a, a demonstrated antitrust harm. Uh, so compulsory licensing is a well-established antitrust remedy once you find uh, a violation. Uh, and I think allowing or sort of requiring people to build in an open and clear API structure that allows others to build uh, products outside uh, the platform that work with it is a really potentially a transformative kind of solution that could open up the markets to competition without saying, okay, we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna chop it up and have five different social media companies. And then maybe I'll just add um, on the front end. So I think Mark, your answer was an answer on the back end, right? Using antitrust law on the back end as a remedy. On the front end, the argument that you would have to construct is, well, actually these content moderation things are a separate product. And so when a platform offers only their own product, it is a bundling, which is impermissible under antitrust law and therefore judge, please make them unbundle. But you would have to be able to make the argument that there is a separate product market for content moderation or APIs or whatnot. And, and just to note, I, I think this does tie interestingly to something Dina did talk about earlier, right? Which is the, but only briefly, which is the parts of the allegation against Google that are preferential self-dealing, right? That we're, we promote our own, um, uh, uh, you know, restaurant search over competing ones, right? We promote our own uh, uh, pieces in which we have an interest. Uh, so there might be, I, I think those are not unrelated, right? Um, short of API opening, right? The other thing you could do is sort of have a kind of neutral platform requirement uh, where the companies either couldn't be vertically integrated or had some sort of self-dealing obligation uh, neutral dealing obligation where they were vertically integrated. All right, Daphne, thank, thank you. you. So good to it's see you. It's super helpful. I, I feel like I should disclose I was the AGC for web search at Google during the FTC investigation. So, but I, as you can tell, I'm not in fact a competition lawyer. <laughs> Thanks for uh, bringing me on. Daphne, good to see you. Um, okay, we have at least three or four other questions I want to get to, and about five minutes left to get to them. So I'm going to try and, and pull off a lightning round if we can. Um, we have a question of, that I think really gets to how do we define the quote unquote market here? Um, and there was a question about how can regulators understand which, you know, when mergers and acquisitions are under consideration, given the ease of integrating different types of software, how do we think about mergers and acquisitions in a context where the market isn't clearly understood? Are you going to, you want to say, I, I mean, Short answer, hard problem. Um, the tools that we have traditionally used in merger analysis put things into either a vertical box or a horizontal box. And if you're not in either box, we say, ah, it's conglomerate, it's no problem, and we throw it away. That's got to change. Right? I think a lot of the real problems come from things that are complementary or adjacent uh, and could end up being uh, not a direct competitor, but a sort of displacing competitor. Um, and we've got to pay more attention to uh, mergers that exist in that space. I'll just okay. add, um, also think it's a really hard problem. 
but two things that we definitely should do, I think at the agency level is increase tech literacy and do more cross pollination between orgs. Because when I, you know, when I talk to people from financial markets, they're just like, how did they let Google acquire double click without requiring ethical walls between the trading of the two? You know what I mean? So. Thanks, yes, Sandy. Yeah, I think this gets to a broader problem. Merger policy today is just far too permissive, whether it's horizontal, vertical, or conglomerate. Um, the agencies challenge very few mergers in a given year, and the guidelines, uh, sad to say, establish a very strong presumption of legality for mergers. And so we need Congress and the DOJ and the FTC through some combination of legislation, regulation, and new guidelines to restrict consolidation in general, and then also establish special rules for acquisitions by dominant firms, because the history of these companies shows that they're often you know, several steps ahead of the antitrust enforcers who are trying to tease out short-term effects when they should simply be saying, no, you're, you're already dominant in one or more markets. Uh, your, your subsequent acquisitions should enjoy a you know, strong presumption of illegality. And you know, if they want to expand, let them expand by investing in a new service, investing in a new product. These companies have no shortage of free cash to plow into new undertakings. All right, thank you for that. So I wanna try then um, to combine two different questions that we got, and then this will be the last question because I wanna allow time for each of you just to have a final closing remark uh, if, if you have uh, thoughts you wanna leave people with. But there are a couple of questions about how our government should be structured or restructured in order to better address uh, many of these questions, whether there need to be new agencies formed, whether uh, the FTC, for example, needs to better sort of integrate their uh, antitrust and, and other sort of working groups if we need to have better international cooperation or some sort of or transatlantic organizations formed, recognizing that you all are lawyers and, and not uh, operating in that uh, sector. Do you have any thoughts around how oversight might better be structured? I actually think the FTC is well positioned to be a, a, an effective regulator in digital markets, among other markets. It combines antitrust with consumer protection missions. It has broad research power. It has rulemaking power. I think the challenge there is simply better leadership and also getting the antitrust side of the shop to talk with the consumer protection. Because from what I've heard from former colleagues um, and uh, acquaintances, there's a real issue of siloed cultures. The consumer protection side thinks and operates in one way. The antitrust side thinks and operates in another way. And there's very little discussion, let alone cross fertilization of ideas between the two halves. Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, Thoughts on this or last comments, Mark or Dina from you since we're just at about time? Um, sure. I, I, so I agree with that and actually be, you know, got a, maybe is a, is a useful com concluding comment, right? Um, I think antitrust can't solve all of our problems, but it can, I think, be, uh, we can use the structures we have to do a lot of good. Um, and I guess I would suggest that um, that's preferable to let's create a new agency to regulate the tech industry. Uh, because I worry that the history of creating industry specific regulatory agencies is not a good one. Um, uh, they lead to capture they, and they lead to sort of cementing in the dominant industry. It is no accident that Facebook runs ads every day in the New York Times full page ads saying, please regulate us, please regulate us. Right? The thing they fear is not regulation. The thing they fear is uh, facing competition. Uh, and uh, we ought to sort of use antitrust as a tool to try to get not everything everyone wants from the internet. That's not going to happen, but, uh, but a lot of it. Thank you, Mark. Dina, last thoughts from you? I just go back to what I said before, which is increase tech literacy and increase, um, increase cross-pollination. Yeah. Hard, hard to argue with that. Uh, well, thank you all. I know we're at time. This has been really, really helpful. I appreciate so much you all taking the time 
given how busy I know you all are. So thank you. Um, and thanks to the audience for really great questions. I wish we had gotten to more of them. I uh, want to turn now to next steps. Uh, we will have another uh, conversation uh, next month uh, in late April, talking about the future of tech governance and connectivity and resilience in Asia, specifically uh, looking after the sort of trade wars with China that began the Trump administration. How is Asia starting to now think about how to better manage their own regional connectivity and resilience and governance. Uh, and we'll hear from some great colleagues there. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll send out something on that front soon. But in the meantime, thank you again, uh, everyone for taking the time today. Really, really appreciate it.